Welcome to episode 70 of Communicast, a communication skills podcast. I'm Scott D'Amico, president of Communispond, a global communication skills training organization. Be clear, be listening, be patient, and be aware. Great tips for my guest this episode, Alan Questel. Alan is the author of Practice Intentional Acts of Kindness and Like Yourself More. In this episode, we talk about the power of mistakes, the benefits of idle chit chat, and why it pays to be kind to yourself and others. I hope you enjoy. Alan, thank you so much for joining me today. I I have to say, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I feel the same way, and thanks so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Now, before we jump too far into things, why don't you tell the listeners, Jess, a little bit about you, your career journey, and the exciting work that you're doing today? Sure. Well, my career journey goes back a long ways ago when I was a professional actor. And I was fortunate enough to work with some well-known people. And during the time that I was pursuing acting, I hurt my back. And I ended up getting involved with a process called the Feldenkrais Method, which is a movement technique that's based on learning theories. And we work with people with orthopedic problems, neurological problems, professional actors, dancers, athletes. And I also had a contracting business at the time, which I did not enjoy, even though I was successful. And I thought, oh, maybe I could do this Feldenkrais work and pursue acting. And it was a four-year training, and I was in the last training with Dr. Feldenkrais. And when I graduated, a year and a half later, I had a waiting list. So I stayed with it, found this was a lot more secure than acting. And... Of course, I've worked a lot with actors and taught in acting schools. And I've even, one of my books is called Creating Creativity, Embodying the Creative Process, which is about acting. Well, it's originally about just about acting. I extended it to make it about the creative process as well. And in the Feldenkrais method, there's two modalities. One is a hands-on technique where someone lies down fully clothed and it's very slow, gentle movements to help reduction of pain, improve functioning, and changes in self-image. And Feldenkrais, at the time he was doing it, he thought, well, I can only touch so many people in a day. So he developed another process called awareness through movement, which is taught to groups. So it's a series of movement sequences someone's led through verbally, and they affect the same kind of changes, but they're they're not as tailor-made for the individual as the hands-on work. And one of the more important aspects of it is the quality and how you move so that you can listen to yourself in other places. So it's not like an exercise where if someone said, bring your elbow to your knee and people would force themselves to do it, this is done much more gently to feel, what am I doing through the rest of myself to do this action? Hmm. To discover how the whole self is involved. And over time, I started to develop a workshop around self-image. And I started to think our self-image is really a reflection of how much I like myself or how much I don't like myself. So if I have a good self-image, I like myself. If it's not so great, I don't like myself. And after some time, I started to think this is my job to help people like themselves more. And I do it, of course, I did it and still do it through the Feldenkrais method. But then... I started asking a very specific question to people in these small movements. I said, are you moving in a way that you like the way it feels? And if the answer is yes, great. But if not, that's significant. That's something to pay attention to. And I, I guess the, the one of the most rewarding outcomes of that I ever experienced, I was graduating a group in Australia after four years. And I'd call up their name and give them their certificate, certificate and give them a hug. And so many people whispered in my ear, I like myself more now. And so that became a big part of my journey and something that I'm still learning about with myself. So it's mm-hmm. not like a, oh, I like myself. As a matter of fact, every level that I, that I managed to achieve in liking myself more, the next level is even harder. It's more challenging. And so this idea of liking yourself more has been a part of my work for many, many years. And then one day, just by happenstance, I wasn't thinking about it, 
and I can't remember what it was exactly. I did some small act of kindness. And in the next moments, I realized I like myself more for doing that. And that led me to write the book, Practice Intentional Acts of Kindness and Like Yourself More. So that's kind of one track that led me to where I am today, but it's a pretty solid one. So, Wow, what a fascinating journey. And what you're starting off with acting and then the, the work that you're doing with the training and kind of that mind-body connection, then ultimately yeah. leading into kindness. And I think you specifically focusing kindness towards yourself really is important today yeah. you know, with, I think, so many people struggling with that, struggling with self, self-image self and you're know, not to go down the rabbit hole of the impact of social media and people comparing right. themselves to each other, which I know yeah. has a big part of it, definitely something important today, both for, for people, I know with young people and teens, but I also think in the workplace, you know, people mm. often get caught up with self-image in the workplace, compare, comparing their career to the career of others. You know, are are they where they think they should be? You know, what's my timeline? All this stuff, this idea of really focusing on being kind to yourself and liking yourself, so important. So thank you for sharing that and for the, the great work that you're doing. I, I have to say that when I was writing the book, when I got to the to the part about being kind to ourselves, I got blocked for about five years. And I thought I was pretty good at being kind to myself. But as mm -hmm. I really investigated it, I had a great deal to learn. And, and I think I still do as well. But yeah, and what you describe in the workplace, but it's not just in the workplace. It's just, just mm -hmm. in our lives in general, the degree of comparison we make to others. And that's actually, you know, a child has a self-image at a very early age. Mm -hmm. And it's usually very positive. They usually do like themselves. They measure the world by their sensory state of comfort, not so much by what others think, although that's part of it. But at a certain age, it flips, and it becomes largely about what others think. And so what I described before about in my classes, about asking people to move in a way they like the way it feels, that's outside of any context. And no one knows if you're doing it or not. So in the book, I actually have a chap of moving with greater pleasure, right? Just when, you, when you're at your desk at work and you go to get a, a drink at the water fountain and go to the bathroom, just to think, can I move in a way I like the way it feels? And the, the nice thing about that, because it's not connected to any specific outcome or context, it kind of goes in through the back door of who we are and over time accumulates and builds till one day we can actually say, you know, I think I like myself a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's big. And, you know, I, I was funny, just last night I was, I was exercising, I was on my Peloton bike and wow. part of that, they have a leaderboard and I would always find myself comparing myself to the others. Like, gosh, I need to catch up to this person. I need right. to catch up to this person. And then at some point I realized, you know, I have no idea. This could be Lance Armstrong on this other bike <laughs> that I see that I'm trying to compare myself to and feeling bad. Then I start looking, okay, I can compare myself to myself, right? It shows me my personal record for that type of ride. And sometimes I'm there, sometimes I'm not. And it yesterday I was realizing, you know what? I'm here, I'm on the bike, I clipped in and to your point, I might not be setting a personal record on this, but I feel good. And right. so, you know, this, the way that I'm moving might not be the fastest, the hardest climb that I've ever done, but you know, I just feel good in the movement. And then, like I said, it just makes you feel good about yourself that I did this, I have accomplished this. Yes. That perhaps if I had just been focused on the leaderboard and trying to be in first place, I may have given up on it because it didn't feel good. It hurt to do it physically right. and mentally. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I, I, you know, just to say. I don't think there's anything wrong with comparing ourselves to others. Mm -hmm. It can bring on the initiative to better ourselves, to challenge ourselves. It's a good thing. But at the same time, the degree to which we do it can yes. be injurious to ourselves. We can hurt ourselves like that instead of saying, but it brings up another question, like what's the outcome of, what do I want the outcome to be for what I'm doing right now? Do I want to be that first person all the time? or? Do I want to just feel better about myself? Do I want to push myself how much for how long? Right? So these are just different questions that, that often we don't ask. We just get involved in it and push ourselves and ignore ourselves at the same time. 
you mentioned focusing on the outcome. And that's a great segue to really what I wanted to talk about yeah. next. Because when it comes to communication, yeah. focusing on the outcome of what you're doing, whether it's an email you're writing, a keynote speech that you're giving, giving you really want to focus on that outcome, right? What do I want my audience to think, do, feel differently after this? So if you think through your career, I'm sure with the, the varied career that you've had, you've probably encountered some really strong communicators. Yeah. So when you hear this term that, you know, so-and-so is a great communicator or they have strong communication skills, what's the image that comes into mind for you? Well, th there are two things that come to mind right away. The first thing I think to be a good communicator or the people who I value as communicators is clarity. That the ideas that they're presenting to me or the ideas that I'm presenting they're getting across to people in an understandable way. Now, if I'm talking about something that's novel for people or new, it's even trickier to be clear, because I'm talking about something that they haven't heard before, they don't understand. So I would say clarity is really up there in terms of one of the things to model and to become when we want to be better communicators. The second thing, which I actually am a little bit more interested in, is the capacity and ability to listen. I think a really good communicator listens. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when people think of communicating, often they think of it, I think, as a kind of one-way street of just putting out ideas to people in an audience. But I don't think that's accurate. I, and I've seen many communicators who can really put out ideas, but they have no idea what's going on in the audience. So to have an idea of what's going on in the audience means that, look, even as I'm talking to you and I can see you, that I see your facial expression, I see you mm -hmm. nod, you see mine, that there's, a, there, there's a, um, a, a response that shows me that the words, hopefully shows me that the words that I'm saying are landing somewhere in you in a way that either makes you thoughtful about something and take it in, or... Maybe it generates another question or another idea. The place that we have to be careful, I have to be careful, I think we all have to be careful when we're communicating, when we're listening to someone, is as they're talking to not already be answering. To let someone finish. So then there's a third thing then, which is patience, right? So a good communicator has to be patient, to really listen, to let someone finish their thought. And I think we've all been in the situation or we all know people, there are friends, family, who they start telling us something and they go on and on and then they start repeating it. And often at that point we go, well, you told me that already. Well, yeah, but, and then they keep going and going and going. And I said, well, this, this is the third time. Yeah, but I'm, okay. And I've learned, I've let them talk till they run out of steam. Now that can take some time and mm -hmm. that can be not so easy. Like I said, we need to be patient in something like that. And then I think we also need to be aware of the audience we're talking to, the expectations that they might have, that I might have. I, I can give you an example of something that's along these lines. It's a bit extreme, but I think it's a good example. So I was on a plane coming back from Europe and I was on the aisle seat, and there were two women in the two seats next to me. One was Asian. The other one, she was a bit special. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean, she was talking nonstop. She was looking out the window. Oh, I can see my luggage. Can you see your luggage? Blah, blah, blah. And this Asian woman's reading a book, and she turns to the Asian woman and says, oh, my goodness, are you Japanese? I've never met a Japanese person before. And this woman says, no, I'm Korean. Oh, I've never met a Korean woman before. And she's going, oh. and I'm thinking, oh, my God, eight hours of that? Can you imagine? Well, I go back to my book, and at some point I turn around, and the Asian, the Korean woman's gone. The other woman's there, and I can see her trying to catch my eyes, and I just keep turning and avoid it. And sometime later, I turn around again, and the kind of unusual woman is gone, and the Korean woman's back. And I said, I'm sorry, I have to ask, what happened? And she said she was driving me crazy, so the flight attendant finally put me in business class. Hmm. I said, okay, and now? She said, 
Well, now she wanted her turn in business class. And now I thought, oh, the poor person in business class. Oh. A couple of hours later, I turn around again. The Asian woman's gone and the other woman's there. And this time she catches me. And I felt myself doing this. And I caught it. And I went, huh. And I kind of let it go and I leaned forward and I started talking with her. And we had a conversation for about five minutes. And after about five minutes, I said, I'm going to go back to my book. And she went, okay, and let it go. And then I realized, this is, we all know people who are very needy and demand a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Imagine what the world is like for them. They're always reaching out like that. And the world is always pulling away. And the more the world pulls away, the more needy they get. And we don't really stop and really listen to the person. Give them our full attention for a short period of time. And as I was able to do, was to pull myself out of it quite easily. And sometimes when I tell this story, people say, yeah, but then the person, you know, that's on a plane. It's a limited engagement, blah, blah, blah. What if they want to be friends? And I said, I've thought of that too. And I've had experience with people. And I've never once encountered the needy person saying, well, I guess we're friends now. You know? Because giving someone your full attention. It's really in communicating. I think that's at the foundation of it. What we're talking about is attention. Attention with myself as I communicate. My attention with them as they're listening. My attention with them as they're speaking, the other. And so these kind of things like, and look, that story I described, it demands a big shift. And how we use ourselves, because the first thing that comes up is what if this person mm -hmm. wants to be friend, right? But to give, what's the worst that happens? Right. You know, the person says, I want to be friends. I'll say, well, that's not, probably not going to happen. Then, then it's a different kind of communication. How to be firm and clear with someone without being unkind to them. So it's a kindness to be honest with someone. It's not so kind to be mm -hmm. critical of someone, you know. And so I think that, that that story about is a good example of kind of extreme listening and what it can afford us. And it's taught me that many situations I'm in, when I feel myself pulling away, I can stop and listen and just pay attention. It's amazing what happens when you really give somebody your full attention and are fully present there, whether it is your children your spouse, significant other, partner, somebody at work, or a random stranger on an airplane. I think those of us have traveled a lot, have definitely encountered those folks. But yeah, when you, as you kind of went through those different things there, when you provide clarity, when you listen, when you're patient, and you have a level of awareness of your audience, yeah. you're able to really connect with people. And I think at the end of the day, most people, they they want that. They're searching yeah. for connection and they ultimately, they want to, to feel like they're being heard and being understood. So when you're able to right. kind of go through those things, you really can right. forge strong connections. And sometimes those connections last a lifetime. Sometimes they last for eight hours on a flight and that's right. it, but it really can make an impact on that other person. And sometimes it can make a profound impact on you just knowing that the change that you've brought about in somebody else. So I think that's fantastic advice. Clarity, listen, be patient, and demonstrate that awareness. You know, you, the, the word you chose to use, which I, I really think is important, is connection. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. We're, we're, I think we're all looking to feel more connected with ourselves, which is not so easy, but mm -hmm. to be connected with others too. You know, and, and, and it's a kind of, my work in the Feldenkrais method in terms of movement is all about connection skeletally through the person, right? But that, that sense of connection, I think, is almost at the basis of what it means to be human. And whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, it's different. And, you know, eight hours on a plane or two hours or whatever is, is actually a long time. Another thing I'm interested in is the, the kind of easy, small connection that happens daily throughout our lives. And, and I call it intentional chit-chat. So, you know, we, I'll tell you, it's, it's a funny story. 
my best friend who unfortunately passed away was a neuroscientist. And years ago, when we lived in New York together, we were online at a bank and he went up to the teller, you know, handed his deposit. And then all of a sudden I heard him say to the teller, how's your day going? And the teller was like, huh, what? Kind of surprised that someone was speaking to him. And they had a brief exchange. And I said to my friend afterwards, I said, where'd you learn that? We grew up in New York City. You know, it was like, that didn't seem kind. <laughs> he said, I don't know. And I started doing it. And to this day, to take a moment when you're in a store picking up your dry cleaning or the cashier at the grocery store, you say, how's your day going? But not to do it like have a nice day kind of thing. Right. It's like to really put your attention on them for a moment. And it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And even like, you know, on the phone, if I'm calling the airline to make a ticket. Oh, hi, Mr. Questel, blah, 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 blah. I say, well, how's your day going? Oh, they say thank. They always say thanks for asking. How's your day going? And I'll tell you, it sets a different ground mm -hmm. for the interaction, you know. And the and one of the best places to do it is if you're going to complain to someone, mm -hmm. right? Instead of going in there antagonistically and trying to get your thing, blah blah blah, taken care of, you go, "How's it going today?" And you meet the person, and they're able to meet you better too. And I think that's something we can practice. Mm -hmm throughout our whole day. I would say I noticed a big shift in my people leadership career uh -huh. when I started taking a more intentional approach to what you just said, intentional chit chat, right? Yeah. You know, early on in my people leadership career, I was just very kind of laser focused in on say one-on-ones, let's jump into it. What's going on? What, what, how can I help? Whatever it is. Versus now, most of my one-on-ones, the first you know, 10 minutes, a lot of times is that intentional chit chat because right. one, it, it's enjoyable. It makes people feel good. As you mentioned, where you actually take the time out of your day to hear about how they're doing, what's going on, weekend, things like that. But also, I mean, selfishly as a leader, you can just learn so much about the people on your team, about you know what motivates them, what challenges are they facing so yeah. that beyond just maybe helping them on the surface of right. surface task level of work, you may be able to assist beyond that, or at least be aware of things that are going on. So you know how to best support them moving forward, which is kind of what I wanted to chat about next, right? As yeah. you're thinking of communication skills and looking at the workplace and the work environment today, you know, what do you think are some of those foundational skills that, that people really should be focusing on developing? So I don't know. Are you familiar with the work of no Marshall Rosenberg of nonviolent communication? Mm -mm. So this was a man. He passed away a little, short while ago, and he, he traveled all over the world mediating between different cultures, different countries in the workplace, and he was quite brilliant. And uh, I, I'll actually send you a link for a video uh, afterwards if you'd like. Um, the nonviolent communication has a very simple process that you go through when you're working with someone, when you're listening with someone. The first step is to make a clear observation. When I say clear observation, I mean something that's concrete and can be seen by others, not some interpretation. Like he gives an example of someone who's saying, well, my boss, my boss doesn't respect me. So how do you know that? Well, it just he doesn't talk to me straight. No. What does he do? Respect? We don't know if someone respects us or not. Right. But what he gets to with this person is saying, when the boss is with me, he talks to another person but doesn't look at me. That's concrete. Mm -hmm. Okay? The next thing is to observe what's the feeling that's evoked underneath that. Well, he doesn't respect me. That's not a feeling. A feeling is anger, hurt, sadness, joy. Those are feelings. And he finally gets to, oh, I guess I feel hurt and angry. Great. And then what's your need as the result of that? What do you need? Well, I need him to respect me. No, 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 not that. I need him to look at me when he talks to me directly. Mm -hmm. right? So it's studying that work, that completely changed my interaction teaching groups. That if someone challenged me with a question, my past response would have been to respond to the content and we'd battle back and forth 
and usually leaving both of us unsatisfied. But then what I started to do is someone came at me with something and I didn't have to ask them what they were feeling. I could see what they were feeling or imagine what they were feeling and I would respond to the feeling. So if someone said, why are we learning this? We should have learned this before, blah, blah, blah. And instead of saying, well, we did learn this and you weren't paying attention and I'm reviewing it now, mm -hmm. I would stay instead. So are, are you worried about what your practice is going to be like? Having just heard this information, almost always people's faces crumble in a good way and their self comes out. And so mm -hmm. I'm responding to the emotional content that's underlying the initial communication. And if I can hear that more and more clearly, then I respond to the person and they actually feel listened to or heard and that there's a path for them to continue on to clarify or understand more of what they need. It goes back to what we've been talking about where people really want to be heard. They want to feel that people yeah. are taking the time and valuing what they say and you're being acknowledged. And yeah. one of the prior guests on this show, uh, what he, his, what the work that he does now is he goes into, you know, violent prisons. I think it was primarily oh. women, pr women's prisons, and yeah. they would teach conflict resolution skills right. and just the success that they've had bringing down recidivism and violent offenses within the system was dramatic and doing something very similar to that understanding the emotion naming and acknowledging the emotion saying, so, you know I, I we can see or sense that you're frustrated or you're stressed or you're angry goes back to that just that human nature people want to feel yeah. understood and yeah. when you're able to do that by having that awareness being patient listening and providing clarity as you talked about earlier you're able to make those connections and as you said the barriers start to yeah. come down and people yeah. will, will open up more and, and feel heard. And I actually see those, all the, those abilities and acts are acts of kindness. I think that's really w what it comes down to is just, mm -hmm. can I, can the world, can we create a little more kindness? Now, I also want to say the things we're talking about, the way you're talking about it, the way I'm talking about it, maybe each of us has a level of skill in these things. It only comes to making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a hard course to learn. It takes a lot of courage to keep doing it and realize, oh, I did it again. But you know what? The, the mistakes I make are my best teachers. Mm -hmm. They're the ones where I go, no, I'm paying more attention to this now. I'm not going to do that mistake again or hopefully not do it again. Right. But, you know, in, in, in my book, I start out with the idea of kindness that this may be more challenging than you imagine to like yourself and to be kind to yourself. They're, they're not such easy tasks to do. And they're from now on. Like I said in the beginning, it's not like I like myself, I'm done. It's like, oh, this continues for me more and more and more. Mm -hmm. as, I, as I think through that, and especially this idea of these skills and having to have practice and make mistakes, the beauty of communication skills is that they are all very learnable. It yeah. takes a lot of practice and it's an ongoing thing. It's just like physical fitness. If you think of your communication yeah. fitness, you have to keep getting those reps in or those skills are going to, to fall away. So mm -hmm. getting the practice. And as you mentioned, when you fail, learn from it. You know, my yeah. son is in, he's in high school and he's really into wrestling right now. Uh -huh. So after his matches, you know, win or lose, we talk, okay, you know, what did you learn? Maybe right. this person was taller than you. What can you take from this match when you fight, when you wrestle another yeah. person that's considerably taller than you or heavier than you, whatever it is, you know, what did you learn from this? So always kind of taking from every interaction and thinking about how can I apply this in the future is, is a powerful, powerful mindset to have. Yeah. I'll tell you, I've had this experience many, many times with some of my graduates or other practitioners where they call me up or come talk with me, and they say, you know, my practice isn't what I want it to be. And I go, okay, and we talk, have you tried this? Yeah, have you tried this? Yeah, have you tried this? No, try that. So they try that, and they usually come back in three or four months, and they say, well, I've done that, and it's still not what I want it to be. Have you tried this? Yes. Have you tried this? Yes. Have you tried this? Oh, try that. And they try that, and three or four months, they come back again, still not what I want it to be. And this happens every single time 
in the third or fourth time they come back to me where I say, have you tried this? Yes. Have you tried this? Yes. Have you tried this? Oh, I'm not comfortable doing that. And the ones who do it and make themselves a little uncomfortable, mm -hmm. the practice takes off. And the ones who don't, it stays the same. So when we talk about practicing something, you know, I always think that, again, there's a kind of a mistaken idea of what practice will feel like. Like it's going to feel great. It doesn't feel great. Sometimes it's really challenging, you know. In my work, one day in a public class I was teaching, a woman asked, what's the point of this work anyway? And it's like, oh, I, I don't like these questions. And I said, <laughs> the point of this work is to make our lives easier and more comfortable. Why, wouldn't, why would you come to a class in your own time, extracurricular, pay money if it didn't benefit your life in some way? And she was mm -hmm. satisfied with the answer. But I wasn't. And I came back the next week and I said, the point of this work is to learn how to struggle well. Because life's going to be filled with struggles. But can I navigate it in a way that I can get through it without hurting myself or hurting another person and become more skillful, like you're saying with your son? What you learn from that, that each time the takeaway is, I'm a little bit better for that. Mm -hmm. And But I tell you, every time I encounter something in one of my classes or something where a student, you know, we have a conflict or something, and I think, okay, I've gotten through that one good and i kind of think i'm done and then some clever student comes another way to bite me in the ass and knock me off my feet <laughs> and where i have to go oh now i got to learn how to do this yep. you know so it's 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 a it's it, at some point we, we we cross the tipping point where it's it's kind of almost interesting to do that you know mm -hmm. you know if if everything was easy all the time i think we'd be bored you know Absolutely. I always tell my team, I'm like, listen, if, if everything was easy, they wouldn't need all of us. So that's right. Exactly. You know, yeah. They wouldn't need us. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and shifting gears a little bit, uh -huh. like, who has been someone from throughout your career that has really helped to influence your communication style? Maybe you've taken something from them, tweaked it, and now it's part of your toolkit when it comes to communication. Well, as I mentioned before, this man, Marshall Rosenberg was one, nonviolent communication. Uh, another teacher for me was, um, and I didn't study with him directly, but I studied with many of his students, was a, a, a doctor named Milton Erickson, who was a psychiatrist who developed something called Ericksonian hypnosis. And the funny thing is the thinking in that work very much parallels the thinking in my work in the Feldenkrais method. And that, that work, I would say that maybe in, in both Feldenkrais and Ericksonian work, one of the things that is emphasized is not teaching the correct or right way to do anything, but teaching more choice. So depending on the context you're in, who you're with, how you feel that day, many variables, you might choose to act one way or choose to act another way. Mm -hmm. So that idea of bringing more choice as a variable into a communication set, skill set, is something that I think allows us to stay more open and responsive to maybe things we didn't expect, right? To understand how choice is an important part of it. You know? I do think when it comes to communication, having that flexibility, and as you mentioned, having choice for the variable to it is, is really important because if you have a core message, you may make tweaks to maybe the specific verbiage to it, or even just the way that you deliver it based on your audience. Right. The way I deliver a message to my you know, direct report team may be different to the way that I deliver that same message to the owner of the company right. and vice versa. So really, right. we talked about this earlier, thinking about the audience, being aware of the audience, right. what... Yeah is important to them, what some yeah. of their objections or concerns may be. You yeah, take yeah, in yeah. all those variables, and that's going to help you internalize. You know what? I need to talk to this person at 9 a.m. in the morning, voice to voice or over Zoom call to relay this message. Right. You know, what? this other person, you know, I can I can give them a call later. I can shoot them a text or an email or, or whatever, right. based on what you know about them. And once again, right. tying it back to that intentional chit chat. 
right. the more you talk with people, the more you yeah. get to know about them, how they receive information, yeah. how they process information. That in turn informs me how I can best really deliver my communication and have a meaningful interaction with them. Yeah. I, I just had a, a, an inter, a not so pleasant interaction with an article I wrote for a journal and it went through two edits with editors from that journal, which seemed really good and I was happy with it. And then all of a sudden they went ahead and edited it and cut out a third of it. And I was like, Whoa, you can't do that. That's not good. And, and unfortunately this was happening on email, this back and forth. And I was doing my best not, not, not to get angry, but I was pretty upset by it. And I said, look, honestly, you can't use the article if you're going to cut a third. Right. Mm -hmm. That's it. And this person, the head editor got very upset with me that it was antagonistic. And we finally calmed it down. And then we had a phone conversation and it was great. And it was like, exactly what you're saying, getting to know the other person. And for me, like email gets us in so much trouble. If there's any emotional tone to it, <laughs> and, <laughs> excuse me, any emotional tone to it intended or not, right, that that happens, and to be able to find other forms of communication that might be more suitable for this person, right? So, I mean, some people love texting, and I have friends, and we just text, and, you know, mm -hmm. but my preferred one is live, you know, whether it's the phone, Zoom is acceptable, but really live is my real preference, especially if there's some challenge or difficulty going on, because I think that's where there's a different sense of being in the room with someone and again, how we can find our way together through an outcome that's satisfying for both of us. I know my team is probably sick of hearing me say this, but it's, you know, have you picked up the phone and called them? Yeah. Simple as that. Oftentimes when you're caught in this loop of right. email communication and you feel like you're on a treadmill, right. picking right. up the phone, taking a couple minutes can really help. And we've had this, especially when we are negotiating contracts yeah. with, with our clients and we get caught up in procurement or legal. 99% right. of the time when we set up a quick call weeks that we've been doing this, you know, going back and forth is resolved right. within 10 minutes on the phone. Yeah. So it is amazing what you can accomplish when you pick up the phone because you strip away the ambiguity and you provide what clarity. Yeah. I do you the, have same the opportunity thing. to listen and to you know, yeah. to demonstrate patience and that awareness. So it's all kind of full circle. Yeah. Pick up the phone. I do, I do the same thing with my teachers or organizers, and they say, "Well, have they, have they gotten back? Well, I wrote them. They didn't get back. Call them. Call them or managers too. People who are running things for me." And all of a sudden, I see something's not working. So they say, well, I told them to do it. And I go, but that's your job as a manager. You have to follow up. You have to see what happens. And that's all part of the communication loop mm -hmm. that needs to happen so that it feeds back on itself. And, and, and all of this, you know, if I, if I bring it back to this idea of listening, that it, it, I think a lot of it starts with a capacity and ability to listen to ourselves. And I talk about that in terms of feeling ourselves as well. Not just listening to my thoughts, which I can believe over and over again, but to how does this land in me? What's the feeling of listening to myself? And, and that's part of the communication with myself as well. Mm -hmm. you know, Because any communication begins there and then it extends out to the other. Just like liking myself is great, but if I can extend it into the world, it shows up as an act of kindness. Right, and, and and these are things that are maybe maybe liking ourselves more and finding more kindness. I think for some people may fall into the woo woo part of the world, you mm -hmm. know, which I understand completely. Well, unfortunately, I'm for just about how it is, and I don't have a problem with that. I think, but if the outcomes you wanted improved, would that make it worthwhile? And the answer is always, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Alan, as we are wrapping up here, what piece of closing advice would you have for the folks listening to this? What is around the importance of developing the skills that we talked about today and you know, the impact that they can have on their, not only their career outcomes, but their, their personal outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say, like I said, at the beginning, the capacity to listen, 
that on, on a very simple, immediate level, when you're having a, a, a more heated or a, a, a more um, fiery conversation with someone, can you can you pull back a little and not res, not react, not jump in with your answer, but let the other person finish, right? Because we need something concrete. Because mm -hmm. the ideas we have, they're all great, but then how do you enact them? Well, you have to practice. Maybe it just means leaning back in the chair. And if you find yourself coming to the edge, sit back again. Let them finish what they're saying. And in the same way, when you're talking with someone and they're reacting like that, to say, what would help me get across my idea right now is if you really, if you can, wait, wait long enough to let me finish what I'm saying. I'll tell you when I'm done. And then, then I'll listen to you. You can go mm -hmm. back and forth. Just to open up the space, get a little more air between myself and the other to, to, to find a, an outcome for us both. And on the flip side of that, when you're on the receiving end of that, one of the best things that you can do is when that person finishes, don't immediately jump in and respond. Like, you know, as soon as their lips close on that last word, don't right. fire yeah. back at them. Right. Take a beat. Yeah. You would be surprised at that one to two seconds. It might yeah. feel like an eternity in your mind. Yeah. But if you give it a beat, give it that one to two seconds, it's going to do a number of things. One, mm -hmm. it'll help you process more. and your, your thoughts may change a little bit. If it is a heated, contentious conversation, it's going to give you a little bit of time perhaps to bring those emotions down. Mm -hmm. But third, and I would say probably most importantly, it will signal to that person that you really were listening. You weren't yeah. just waiting to respond. So when you right. take that second or two beat, mm -hmm. it's not that long. I just did it there. Yeah. Take that beat and then respond. It will have a big impact on the outcomes of those conversations. I would even add one more little piece in there, which I think is known to many of us, which is when someone finishes, let's take a beat and then say, is it okay if I reflect back what I heard? And Sometimes I start talking, and that's not what I say. Okay, well, what did you say? Mm -hmm. And we go back, so I get more clear about what you actually presented, so then I can be more clear in my response. Yeah. Spot on. Alan, yeah. thank you so much for joining me today. Thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. I hope you do, too. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Take care. A special thanks again to my guest, Alan Questel. Alan's point about being kind, especially to yourself, really resonated with me. It's easy to get caught up in self-doubt and imposter syndrome and to project those negative feelings onto others, which will ultimately have an impact on your life. As we wrap up this episode, remember that the journey of improving communication skills is ongoing. Make sure to stay connected with Communicast by subscribing so you can benefit from conversations with future guests. If you found value in today's episode, I'd be grateful for your support. Leaving a rating or review is a fantastic way to let us know the impact this show has had on you. Thanks and have a great day.